<coughs> Excuse me. Okay, everybody. <laughs> Chapter five of Emil and the Detectives. So the first four chapters really have set the scene, okay? Uh, we've learned about um, Emil. He lives with his mother. Um, his mother washes, is a hairdresser. Um, he adores his mother and he's, he's, he's off to Berlin to visit his grandmother and he's got a lot of money uh, in his pocket, which he's, 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 he's feeling quite anxious about. And on the train to Berlin, it is now just a meal and Mr. Grundeis, who uh, is a man with a long face uh, and a bowler hat. Uh, I'll just remind you, here they are. All right, chapter five uh, is called The Chase Begins. Emil woke up just as the train was pulling out of the station and found himself on the floor feeling very frightened. He must have been asleep, he thought, and slipped off the seat. Now, for some reason, his heart was beating like a sledgehammer. He couldn't remember where he was at first and then gradually it all came back to him. Of course, he was in a train going to Berlin in a compartment with a man in a bowler hat. And he had fallen asleep too. The man in the bowler hat. That brought back Emile's wits. He sat up and rubbed his eyes. The man was gone. Emile slowly got to his feet, feeling quite shaky. Then from sheer force of habit, he began to brush the dust off his trousers and jacket. And that reminded him of the money. Was it safe? He couldn't bear to feel for it in case it was gone. He leaned against the door, too anxious to raise a finger, just staring at the seat where that man called Grundeis had been sitting and had gone to sleep and snored. And now Grundeis was gone. It was silly to take the worst for granted like this, just because the man had left the train while Emile himself was asleep. Naturally, the passengers would not all be going as far as the Friedrich State Street station where he was to get out. Of course not. And he had pinned the money in its envelope securely onto the lining of his jacket. So surely it must be safe. He had only to put his hand into that inner pocket on the right hand side and his hand went slowly towards it and felt about in it. The pocket was empty. The money had gone. He felt right into the corners of that pocket and searched frantically through all his other pockets too. He ran his hands over the outside of his jacket, but there was nothing there to crackle. The notes were gone. He gave one last frantic rummage round the inner pocket and cried out. The pin was still there and had run into his finger. It stuck in and left a bead of red blood where he pulled it out. He wound his handkerchief round the finger and, tear, and a tear trickled down the side of his nose, not because of the prim prick, of course. He didn't cry for such trifles. Why, a fortnight ago, he ran into a lamppost so hard that he almost knocked it over. He still had the bruise on his forehead, and even that hadn't made him cry. No, it was the money, and because of his mother. You can understand that. It had taken his mother months to save that seven pounds to take him to Berlin. He knew all about that, yet he had fallen asleep as soon as he was in the train. And while he was having that crazy dream, that pig of a man was actually stealing the money. It was enough to make anyone cry. What was to be done about it? Had he got to go on to Berlin and say to his grandmother, I've come, but I may as well tell you right away that I haven't bought any money and I'm afraid you'll even have to give me some to buy my return ticket when I go home again. He couldn't do that. But the money was gone and grandma would not get a penny of it. How could he go and stay there after that? But he couldn't go home again either, and all because of a low, mean chap who offered you chocolate and then pretended to be asleep so that he could steal your money. It really was a terrible thing to have happened. But Emil soon sniffed back the tears and looked about him. He might pull the communication cord and the train would stop and the guard would come along to find out what was, what was wrong. What's the matter, he'd ask, and Emil would tell him, my money's been stolen. But as like as not, the guard will only say, well, better take care of it next time. 
and then he'd be sure to ask for Emil's name and address. We shall have to write to your mother, he'd say. Penalty for improper use of the communication cord. Five pounds. She'll have to pay up, you know. Now get back into the train, quick. Express trains have corridors so that passengers can walk from one end to the other. If Emil had been in one of those, he could have gone along to the guard's van straight away and reported the theft. But his was a slow train. It had no corridor and there was nothing he could do until it stopped at the next station. By that time, the man in the bowler hat might be miles away. Emil had no idea when he had left the train. He began to wonder what the time was and, and how soon they would reach Berlin. Out of the window he could see blocks of flats and houses with flower gardens and then a lot of dirty red chimney stacks. Perhaps it was Berlin. He would go and find the guard at the next station and tell him what had happened. Oh, but then of course they would report it to the police. Oh dear, the police. If he got mixed up with the police now, Sergeant Jeska would be bound to hear about it and bring up that matter of the statue. Ah, he'd say, I have my suspicions about that boy Emil Tischbein. First he defaces a fine statue here in Neustadt with chalks and then he says he's been robbed of seven pounds on the way to Berlin. How are we to know that he ever had seven pounds? In my experience, anyone capable of defacing a monument is e quite equal to making up a story like that. He's probably buried the money somewhere or even swallowed it. Don't waste your time looking for a thief. If ever there was one, it was probably Emil Tischbein himself. I advise you to arrest him at once, Inspector. Oh, it was horrible. He couldn't even go to the police for help. Emil dragged his suitcase down from the rack and put on his cap. He stuck the pin carefully back in the lapel of his coat and was ready to get out. He had no idea what to do next, but he couldn't bear to stay in that compartment any longer. The train slowed down and through the window he saw rows and rows of shining rails. There were a lot of platforms too. And he saw porters running along beside the carriages, ready to help people with their luggage. Then the train stopped. Out on the platform, the name of the station was written up in large letters. Zoological Gardens. Carriage doors flew open and a lot of people got out. Some had friends waiting for them and they waved and called to one another. Emil leaned out of the window of his carriage to look for the guard. Then suddenly a little distance away in the stream of departing passengers, he saw a bowler hat. At once, he thought, ah, Mr. Grinweiss. Had he not left the train after all, but only skipped out of one compartment and into another while the train stopped and Emil was asleep. Without another thought, Emil was out on the platform. He forgot the flowers on the luggage rack, but just had time to scramble back after them, dashing in and out of the train as quickly as he could. Then flowers in one hand and suitcase in the other, he scurried off towards the exit. People leaving the train were packed tight near the barrier and could hardly move. In the crush, Emil found he had lost sight of the bowler hat, but he blundered on, stumbling round people's legs and bumping into them with his suitcase. But he kept doggedly on till he saw it again. But then, all at once, there were two bowler hats. The suitcase was so heavy it slowed Emil down terribly, but it might get stolen if he put it down somewhere so that he could run after his man. He just had to plunge on and at last he came nearly level with the bowler hats. But which was the right one? One man seemed too short. Emil twisted in and out of the crowd after the other, like a red Indian on the trail, and was just in time to see his man push through the barrier, evidently in a great hurry. Just you wait, you dirty rotten thief, he thought to himself. I'll catch you yet. He gave up his ticket, changed the suitcase to his other hand, wedged the flowers firmly under his right arm and ran down the stairs. Now for it, he thought. Okay, I'm going to stop there. That was uh, part one.